Welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, choosing to join me. As I hope everyone can see clearly from uh, this first slide, we're going to be talking today um, about engagement with soft skills, uh, using board games at the library to engage patrons and improve your career readiness. Um, and so while I kind of give you a little background about myself and, and my interest in games, uh, go ahead and type in the chat if you wouldn't mind people who have games at their library um, and I think I actually can see that. I was going to tell you I won't see them right away and I'll just get it later, but I have been seeing your messages fly by. So, um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I have been working in libraries since uh, 1997. Um, I started off in public libraries. I um, transitioned to academic libraries around 2004. Um, where I worked at several institutions until just this past year. Uh, I started at the State Library in January of 2019. Um, obviously, in a few of the public libraries I worked, we had some games, uh, not huge collections. And I would say my impression in the late 90s was any libraries who had them were definitely starting to phase them out because of issues of keeping pieces in order and check out complications and things like that. So I sort of unfortunately figured maybe that won't be something I'll get to do in my career. Uh, when I got into academia, it was still pretty new. Um, uh, my first job was at Purdue University and right around 2006, um, there was a conference that was put on in Chicago called, um, uh, what was it, Gaming Learning Literacy Symposium. And uh, our dean sent like a massive amount of, of librarians up there. I unfortunately did not get to go. Um, but I learned a little bit about it. Some of our librarians learned about it. And we started talking about it at Purdue. Um, my time there, I didn't really get a chance to develop a large collection, but I was able to go the next year and actually present. It was a great experience, and I met some very interesting librarians, including Jenny Levine and Scott Nicholson, who many of you may know started uh, what was at the time National Game Day, because they wanted to break a record of playing the same board game in, in libraries across the world. Um, that has morphed and grown, and it's now International Games Week, uh, and that was just early in November. So some of you may have been using games. I've seen lots of people responding that they have games. Um, but at my third academic library, when I was finally able to convince the higher powers to start purchasing games, obviously we had to put a use case uh, in there and how they could be useful to students and faculty. And so that's mostly what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, first we'll spend a few minutes to sort of defining the need and how I kind of made that case. Um, I will then go very, very briefly into board game mechanics um, and how those can help us help prepare our patrons, our users, um, and how they can improve the soft skills. I'll probably spend the bulk of time talking about some examples. I have a couple of screens of resources for you, but it's, of course, not an exhaustive list. And then if I didn't see your message fly by during my speaking, I'll spend some extra some time at the end answering any questions. Um, and I'll just warn you guys in advance that sometimes I can fly through stuff. So if I'm going too quickly, definitely you know, put something in the chat kind of give me some cues to, so I can slow down. Um, or I can talk about something at such great length that we might not get all the way through. So uh, definitely kind of give me heads up if I'm doing either one of those things. OK, so what was the need? Um, so first off, the Society for Human Resource Managers, SHRM, like most professional organizations and associations, they conduct surveys of their users all the time. Um, and so for years, they've been surveying HR managers and their impressions of the people they hired new in that past year. So one thing that they find consistently, and so this is the executive summary, and I've kind of highlighted the wording they used, but one thing they have found consistently year in and year out 
is that new hires most com or HR managers report that new hires most commonly lack or can't apply soft skills. Um, and so I've kind of bulleted them over here, the five that come up most often. So things like collaboration, or sometimes they call it teamwork, being able to communicate with other coworkers, uh, critically thinking about problems, leadership, and then just problem solving in general. And so of course in academia, most professors focus on the hard skills, the stuff that they need from their particular field. And it's really hard to teach soft skills. And it's, it's kind of something that's been plaguing uh, academic libraries and academic institutions for years. Um, but because I have such a passion for games and I was sort of working with career service folks at multiple institutions anyway on how to prepare students for uh, job interviews and job searching, I sort of saw this natural fit that in many board games and, and other social activities, you can develop these skills. So I kind of pitched it, was able to buy some games, and then really had to get faculty to understand and, and use the games. And I think we can do the same. So for most of us, I'm guessing, are public librarians, I think we can sort of transition or, or use these same concepts. And for any academic librarians out there, I'd love to talk to you as well. So first, um, understanding how games are created and played can help us make those connections. So a board game mechanic is just kind of a broad picture of how a game plays. So if you're reading a review online, if you're reading something from the publisher and they use some of these terms, once you start to know them or if you've played a lot of games, you kind of start to see these patterns. Uh, most games, of course, use more than one mechanic. Typically, one is sort of the dominant, and they may have some other number of secondary mechanics. And so even someone who's not a board game enthusiast probably will relate to this example, that Monopoly is often called a roll and move game. You roll the dice, you move your piece. That's the primary mechanic. But there's also a set collection involved. Obviously, you have to get the right properties in the right patterns to perform well in the game. And there's also a little bit of economics involved. So there are skills that can be picked up in terms of you know having enough money and when to buy and sell and things like that. Um, so understanding those mechanics or knowing what mechanics a game might employ can help you tell a bit about what soft skills they might help instill or reinforce or even foster in those who play them. So here are just a very, very small list of some mechanics that are used um, a lot recently. Um, the first is, some, is often called an area control mechanic. Um, you can think of games like Risk or Access and Allies, where the primary function in the game is to control an area on usually a board, a map, or whatever. Um, Games that employ the area control mechanic definitely have many other mechanics involved underneath. And so just the nature of area control could uh, could relate to many of those soft skills. Usually things like critical thinking and problem solving, but depending on how you're supposed to control the area as the player of the game, you might have to communicate with the other players, or you might have to write notes to people, or you might have to uh, understand a message someone else is trying to convey. Uh, and we'll talk about some examples of that a little bit later. Um, my favorite mechanic is collaborative, uh, mainly because I got tired of, of playing super competitive players. Um, and in a collaborative game, instead of all players being out for themselves, it's usually that all of the people playing the game are working together as a team and trying to beat the game itself. And obviously, the one that's most easily identified here is things like um, teamwork or collaboration. Uh, but you can also see leadership skills developing here, communication skills, and then usually critical thinking or problem solving or both, depending on how the game works. 
Um, some classic examples here, I believe the picture that we started with was Forbidden Island, excuse me, uh, Pandemic, if anyone's heard of that one. Um, and there are lots of others that have been coming out over the last few years. Uh, and collaborative can also be collaborative or semi-collaborative. So if you're going to do these in a library environment, you might want to be aware of games that have hidden roles and are only semi-collaborative. Um, oh, I just completely blanked on the name of it, but there's at least one that I've heard of and read about where you start the game off where everyone's working together and then partway through one or more players is actually going against the rest of the people. So um, while these sound interesting to me, I could definitely see where if you're not careful. Oh, yes, Betrayal is definitely one of those. Uh, thanks, Valerie. Um, it's one of the Camelot games was the one I was thinking of. But anyway, um, so collaborative is my favorite mechanic, but obviously there are definitely some things you, you need to be aware of if you're going to use these in programming um, or have them out for your patrons. Um, so collaborative was probably the hot mechanic uh, du jour a couple of years ago. Um, it is slowly was replaced by legacy games, which I can talk about if anyone wants to. Um, but now one of the sort of hot mechanics is roll and write. Um, so in a roll and move game like Monopoly, it's pretty passive and there's not much interaction with the other players. But in a roll and write game, the active person rolls the dice or, or does some action and then everyone can look at that and make decisions based on it. Now, usually the person who's active gets more power in the decision making, but everyone gets to work off that. Um, and there are tons of examples in this new uh, field. And I kind of, yeah, <laughs> um, I kind of think about these as an interactive version of Yahtzee, some of the more basic in this, in this genre. Uh, Quix, I believe, was nominated. It did not win a few years ago, the major uh, board gaming award of the year, but it was definitely up there. And it's very similar to Monopoly. You're rolling some six-sided dice, you're adding them up, and you're making decisions on them. But as I said, it's not just me doing my thing and you doing your thing totally separate, and we just happen to be sitting together. You're watching my rolls and trying to decide what you can do to benefit from what I've rolled, and I'm doing the same when it's your turn. And finally, worker placement games. And, and this is relatively broad, but basically um, the game presents a limited number of actions that is available to all of us. And after turn order has been determined, the first person gets to choose from all of them, and then the next person chooses from one less, and so on and so on. So there's definitely some competition in these games. There's definitely sort of critical thinking. Um, normally those actions are that where you're placing your worker get you stuff and then you need to collect the right combinations of things to advance yourself through the game. Um, and I am going to attempt this, go out to the web. Uh, and so this is a site that I put together at my last uh, academic library. Um, the PowerPoint, well, the, the slides will be shared, uh, the link will be shared. Um, but here is where I have quite a few more um, game mechanics and descriptions of how I think they can be used and which uh, soft skills they can be kind of tied to. Um, and then I try to do examples of each one. Okay, so I'm going to jump back over here for now. Full screen. There we go. Whoops. Sorry about that. Okay. So, examples and how this works. So, what we're seeing here is a game called For Sale. It is a very quick game. It's a deck of cards and some chits, and you really wouldn't even need the chits as long as people can keep track of their money. And what they're doing is they're bidding on properties that are represented by those cards in the first phase of the game. They buy up all those properties, and then in the second phase of the game, you lay out some checks, and you're trying to get the highest value check by sacrificing one of your properties. So basically, I spend my money to get it, and then I sell it back. 
I'm trying to make a profit on each one. Um, it's a really fun, quick game. Um, I actually heard students talking about return on investment when they were playing this. I mean, they, they sort of internalize the concepts of the course, depending on what course you use it in. Um, but in terms of soft skills, again, they are critically thinking about each decision they make. How much do I bid? Am I going to get outbid? When do I drop out of the auction and take a less valuable property um, but save money for, for future? Um, so there's, a, there's knowledge they have, um, but depending on the number of players, there's, there's things removed from the game so they don't have perfect knowledge. Um, and games like this can be really powerful at those sort of critical thinking skills. Um, they also had a lot of fun. Um, and interestingly enough, the professor I did this with, because he was kind of a marketing guy, he always wanted there to be some stakes on the line besides them just playing and having fun and subconsciously uh, absorbing these soft skills. So he would typically allow the winner a free pass on like an assignment or something like that. Um, but if you get swag from conferences or you have other things, obviously you could very easily adapt something like this to, you know, the winners of games get their name in a hat for some big prize if you've only got one, or they get library pencils or, you know, uh, tote bags or things like that. There's a lot of ways you could tie this to the marketing of the library. Okay. On the left, we see a game called No Opportunity. And this one was actually developed as an educational tool by a teacher. I believe she was a high school teacher. I, I can't remember where. And there's an, there is a 32-week curriculum for this game. Um, now, I never had professors want to use the full curriculum in a college course. But basically, they are entrepreneurs trying to start a company. Uh, and in a very monopoly-type fashion, they have to move around this board and draw colors based on those, or draw cards based on those colors. And some of them, you know, force them to make an elevator pitch, which is why the faculty member liked it about their company. Some of them, you know, just give them a number to record on the sheet, either positive or negative, something that happened to their company. Um, and there are some squares on the board that allow them to sort of gamble on a currency exchange. So as their company moves global, they can choose whether they want to invest some of their money in a country outside of their home country. And maybe it pays off, maybe it doesn't. So again, this one was truly a game designed for teaching. Um, but it was a lot more fun than any of the types I'd seen growing up. And it definitely tied to the course. Again, this was a marketing professor, so he, he did a, a really good job of tying this to, you know, creating your elevator pitches, practicing them, having those ready. Um, and similar to that last game we talked about, he wanted some stakes on the line. So instead of the game's rules, just say when you make those sales pitches, you just roll a die and see how much money you get from your investor. Well, obviously, he wanted to add a more objective measure. So he and I were sort of like the sharks on Shark Tank. And we would decide how much that pitch was worth. Um, so instead of randomness, you could have them making presentations to people or not, uh, or whatnot. So this is a really good one, both just, just for fun, but also kind of tied to high school and or college level classes. Um, and then on the right, we have a, a sort of a bigger picture of the, the game we saw at the very beginning. Um, this is Forbidden Desert. It's a collaborative game, so the players are working together. Um, and in this game, Everyone can perform a set of standard actions, so moving around that board, clearing the sand away, uh, exploring tiles, and things like that. Um, and then they each have a role that gives them specific actions. So because it's a desert, one of them is expert in car the carrying and storing of water. And so that person plays a critical role in keeping the, the group alive as, as the desert and the sun blare down and the storm rages. Um, and so this is this and other collaborative games 
are probably one of the most successful things I used in classes. And it was typically in a class for uh, conflict management. So if you have groups who like to use your library or you have, you know, employees who, who like to sort of talk about those sorts of issues, this one can be a really, or other uh, collaborative games, can be a really good to look at it. And because it was a business level class, instead of the roles that are assigned in the game, we modified them to fit roles in a company. So obviously there was the IT department, there was the sales team, um, there was the executive team, etc. And so a game, anyone who's familiar with these probably knows, you can probably play uh, from this designer, from, from the people who designed this and, and others, usually it you can lose as fast as 10 to 15 minutes if you get really unlucky. Uh, and usually it's done in 45 minutes or an hour at the absolute longest. Every time I played one of these with her classes, it usually took three to four hours because the students would just talk so long and think out every decision, which was great from an academic sort of learning perspective. Um, and in almost every class that we did this, she had to stop them partway through and talk about, you know, at the beginning of the, the semester when we all got together and you complained about how nothing got done in your work environment and blah, blah, blah. And then she could point out, look, you, not, you guys aren't letting anything get done because you're not listening to each other. You're not talking through the issues. So there, are, there can be some really powerful learning moments uh, in games like these. Um, and again, they are collaborative, so it can be a team effort. And I've certainly read about and heard about libraries uh, and other sort of board game enthusiasts across the country and the world who use them for competition. So you could have, you know, patrons sign up in groups of three or four, play the game, and create some sort of measure of success. Um, now, those measures of success usually aren't going to be built into the game itself, um, but I've, I've seen lots of tools online that can allow you to kind of rate how well they, what you know, obviously living or dying is one way, you know, winning the game or not, but to judge the difference between two teams that either won or lost, uh, there are tools out there. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, the other interesting thing, um, although it's kind of interesting, but it's, but it's also a caveat, um, in games like this, uh, there is a, a problem, some people call it a problem, um, that has been identified and is possibly why less games are being made with this mechanic recently. Um, but some people call it quarterbacking, um, where one person tries to take over, or maybe multiple people try to control what others do. Um, so it's good to have a discussion or at least make the people aware of it if they're going to play it in the library and then they can possibly have a discussion uh, before they play about how they want to address those sorts of issues. I mean, the intent of these, from everything I've read and talked to most designers, is that you work as a team and you kind of make decisions together, but the ultimate decision for each thing is up to that individual player. Um, but it's definitely something to be aware of, especially if you do have multiple copies of these sorts of games. That, and if you have enthusiastic players, they can get a little loud. OK. Um, this is another example of a collaborative game, uh, Pandemic. It's possibly the best known. Uh, it's certainly one of my favorite games. Um, and again, in this one, very similar. Everyone can do the same basic four or five things and then they have specialties and you're just trying to control the spread of disease. Um, so in a good game like this, you, you can get very immersed um, in the theme of the game uh, and the time can go pretty quickly. Um, so here I think we have a much better example. Uh, this, this group of students played it much more um, collaboratively. I don't remember how long it took them, but it was not like a four hour thing that should have only taken 35 or 40 minutes. <laughs> yes. Um, Walmart, Target, 
some others have definitely picked up on on board gaming and there are several hot games that appear pandemic was one of them for several years i don't know if it is anymore but it's definitely a game i really like okay and then this last example uh probably the the granddaddy of board games not in terms of the entire history of board games but in sort of re sparking the passion uh, of players here in America. And if you can't recognize or don't recognize it, this is Settlers of Catan. Um, it is a highly successful game. I, millions upon millions of copies, I believe, were sold in Germany uh, before it was sort of brought over. Um, sometimes people just call it Settlers now. Um, but the reason I've got this one on here is because this one not only do you have to communicate with people and you have to sort of do some critical thinking on how you place your pieces and what you build, etc., but you really can't be successful at this game unless you trade with people. The, you'll see the cards kind of down here in front. They represent your basic resources. You get those depending on where you have your little towns and cities built. Um, so certain people might have a heavy majority if not a monopoly on a certain resource and so everyone needs the same basic resources to build the same components to score the points um, so it's it's a game that kind of forces you even though you're competing against one another to make trades and obviously that requires not only problem solving and critical thinking but sort of value judgments and uh, communication skills etc to try to work with the other players to get a resource you may need <clears throat> and because it's been around so long there are tons of expansions and, and themed versions I believe there's a Star Trek Catan and probably a Star Wars Catan and other um, versions of it if your population is more interested in, in those sorts of things Excuse me. <coughs> okay better all right So, moving on. Oh, wow, we're at the resources already. See, I didn't get stuck in talking too much. So, uh, I'll talk about a couple of these really quickly, and then it looks like I'm going to have lots of time for questions. Um, the one I want to highlight on here the most is probably uh, Scott Nicholson's Everyone Plays at the Library. Um, it's almost in its 10th year. And this is a book that I wish I had read before I started collecting board games. Now, I didn't see every chat that went by, but it looks like a lot of people have collections already, which is awesome. I am all for that. Um, but at least in my own experience, I started collecting and I started to try to plan events and I got really low turnout. Um, and I, I think if I had read through this book first, I, I might have had more success. Um, so he, he does a great job of doing a little bit of overview of, of games and some of the stuff I've just talked about here, mechanics. and But he also talks about audiences and how to pick things for the, the audience you're trying to engage with. He talks about events um, and whether you want to target one or two games versus lots of games at the same event length of time, how to market. So it's just a really good resource uh, for covering those types of things. Um, obviously for any academic libraries or anyone who's thinking about teaching through games, uh, the, the last one there, Andrew Walsh's his book is interesting. Now that one is less on traditional board games and more just on using game-like activities. Um, but I believe he talks about board games as well. Uh, it's been a little while since I looked at that one. Um, and then Brian Mayer and Christopher Harris, uh, Libraries Got Game, Aligned Learning, they are, I believe, school librarians. Um, and so there's a, a, an interesting perspective there on using them in the classroom in a much more formal way than I ever did. Um, and usually for longer periods, since, since they're somewhere in the K-12 through realm, um, it's not a one-off like I was doing in college. Um, and I know another big thing, I didn't talk about it today, but obviously many libraries are also uh, allowing 
groups to use their space for role playing, D and D and other games. Um, so the functions of role playing games and how to participate or how participants create community, solve problems, and explore identity is a really good resource for anyone who's either thinking about doing it or maybe has let it happen but wants to be a little bit more purposeful about it. Um, there's some great advice in that book. Uh, and then lastly, I'll mention just a couple of websites. Again, I, I have a much longer list for anyone who's interested. Um, but if you want to learn about the games themselves and their mechanics, I would strongly recommend Board Game Geek. Uh, it has a great searching and sorting tool where, where you can pick an audience that you're targeting, either age or whatever. You can pick a style of game you're interested in. You can pick uh, lots of different sort of checkbox type options and filter down the, I don't, probably in the tens of thousands of games that's on there. I, I don't know how many are now in their, their database, but it can help you curate some lists to, to maybe begin your investigation. Um, Meeple Like Us is a really good blog slash website. I'm not exactly sure how they uh, identify themselves, but they deal uh, with accessibility issues. So if you either have a game that you're not sure or is not getting used, or if you're debating a game purchase, you may want to look at their write-ups. Um, obviously, I'm sure they have a much smaller list of games they have been able to review. Um, but when they write their reviews, they're always basing it on the perspective of accessibility. So things like color blindness, things like mobility, um, font size, all sorts of things that um, you can use to maybe decide whether a game is appropriate for either your library as a whole or for uh, particular audiences. Um, and then and this is a, 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 a category that is growing every day. Um, I don't have nearly all of them mastered yet, but if you are interested in learning how to play a game without sitting down and reading through the rule book, or if you have read the rules and you just want to kind of hear someone who's super into games explain it, um, and there are tons of these, I guess, vodcasts, I don't know what the right term would be, but people on YouTube who do this for a living. Uh, and some of the ones I like, um, which are <laughs> appropriate for all settings, are Watch It Played uh, and Game Night. Uh, and Game Night is basically some of the people behind that website, Board Game Geek, which was the first on the internet to start categorizing and cataloging uh, board games. Um, the Watch It Played games, or uh, videos, I should say, those are much more manageable. 10 to 15 to maybe 20 minutes for just a rules explanation. Um, he occasionally does playthroughs as well if you want to see the whole game played out. Um, but game night is almost exclusively playthroughs, so those can be an hour or longer depending on the game. <clears throat> but the nice thing about those is the first however many minutes, 10 or 20 minutes, um, are focused on the rules and how you set the game up and then they however long it takes them to play it and then the uh, last five or ten minutes depending on the game are set up to be uh, an overview of what they thought so um, those are the resources uh, at least that I wanted to highlight here I've got lots more if anyone needs them um, but if anyone has any specific questions, I am going to be happy to take those now. No one stopped me or slowed me down, so I went through that pretty quickly. Is there anything uh, anyone wants me to go back over?
What board games do you recommend? I saw part of that. I'm going to jump back over here so I can see the full. What, Pardon me. What board games do you recommend starting with? Okay. So starting with, I would actually probably read either through ILL or from someone else, maybe get Scott Nicholson's book. Um, he has some good suggestions for where to start, but I think more importantly, he has great advice on deciding what sort of audience you want to focus on first, and that will really help drive that question. So for example, um, if I wanted to use my collection more for drop-in type events, um, I would pick games that played much shorter. Um, I would pick games that were maybe a little easier to learn. Um, so things like those roll and writes play really quick. Um, some of the party style games, um, there are a few of those code names and some others that can sort of be, people can drop in and out of if they want. So if there's some people that are interested and in start the game and then people walk up and see it being played, obviously um, they could jump right in, make the teams bigger, or they could, so others could leave and it would still work. There, there are many games that are like that. Um, but if you were, if you had either people you thought would be interested or had gotten responses of, you know, more crunchy or, or, or heavy games, um, which is a term in the industry, um, then you're going to look at something like, and Catan is by no means heavy or crunchy, but obviously it's quite a bit more to learn than, you know, Quix, which is kind of Yahtzee on steroids, or, you know, one of those party games. Um, so things like Catan, uh, Agricola, some of the more classics are good places to start. Um, and then, so we, you know, we're playing, oh yeah. Um, and then, yeah, lots of card games. Um, it was a little hard to see because I used it as a watermark, but in that opening uh, screenshot on the title, there were a couple of card games that are both collaborative, but they're pretty fast to play. Um, and several of them, you're not supposed to talk, which is great for libraries. So there's one called The Mind. Everyone has a hand of cards, uh, and the first rounds of the game, you have lower numbers of cards, and as you progress, you get more and more cards. And they're simply numbered 1 to 100, and there's only one of each. So your objective, without talking to anyone else, is to play what you feel is the lowest card, and then the ne you know next card, next card, next card, until you are out of cards. Um, and obviously, if someone plays a card and you had one lower, that round is lost and you try again. Um, so there are several games kind of in that genre, uh, quick card playing games, um, some of which are intended for you to be silent, <laughs> which is can be good for a library. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing Munchkin, that one's great. Exploding Kittens, I've seen it, I have not played it, but I've heard very good things about it. Um, so again, I would say it's going to be partially based on the audience you're going for and partially based on the amount of time you or your staff has to teach or whether you think people can just learn it on their own and then whether you're checking out or not. Um, if you're specifically hoping to foster some of the uh, soft skills that I was talking about, um, you are going to look for games that use specific mechanics. And that website, which I brought up briefly, which will be shared out, um, where I started to document these when I was still at the academic library. Um, those mechanics and many others you can find on BoardGameGeek and sort of find games that match those mechanics. So anything that makes people have to make decisions um, can do problem solving or critical thinking. Anything that sort of engages or, or requires people to talk to each other, obviously, or, or to draw, so Pictionary can actually be used for communication in that you're trying to create something that they not only understand, but that they can figure out the, the clue card from or, or whatever. So, you know, lots of games, and, and I would contend almost any game can help foster at least one of those skills. 
uh, what else do we got? We make sure we include instructions. Yep, definitely. I'd make backups of construction uh, instructions. Uno is a really really popular. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if you haven't seen it, the come I don't remember which Hasbro or Milton Bradley, whoever owns Uno, has now created at least two variants. Uh, one called Dose, uh, which I have, but I have not gotten to play yet. And one called was it Twi Uno Twist or Twist Uno, where the cards are double sided. And you start the game on quote the easy side, which is what we all remember and think of as Uno. And then, but they've added a couple of cards that force everyone to flip their hand over, and then they play on the dark side. It's light side, dark side, which of course I find funny. Um, but the draws get worse, and the wilds get worse, and et cetera. So yeah, Uno can be can be a lot of fun. Yeah, there are tons of different Unos. Yeah. Moncala, yeah. So the comments are coming fast, and I may not have seen them. Are there any other big burning questions? Because as I said at the beginning, I can talk about this stuff far longer than an hour, if, I, if you all want me to. <laughs> Dutch Blitz, spot it, yeah. Do others have these games to use in library, or do they check out? So, yeah, I mean, I'd love to see what other people say about that. Um, I have seen libraries that do both. Um, if you check out, there are all sorts of things that you want to consider, and I'm certainly not an expert in that, but I would definitely talk to others who do allow them to check out. Uh, for years, I know one method was to weigh the games, but I've heard recently that that's not the best way because depending on time of year and humidity levels, the weight might be different. I mean, one, you need a super sensitive scale. And two, um, the, the humidity level can change the weight of the game, especially if it's a game that has lots of cardboard pieces that can kind of absorb the moisture. Uh, um, Karen is asking questions about that type, the game that has the lowest card. What was the Oh, yeah, The Mind. The Mind? Is the one I have, yeah. And there's another one from the same publishers. I believe it's called The Game. It's very similar, um, but it's got a couple of twists in it. But the same kind of thing where you're not, it, the communication amongst players is very limited, if not no talking at all. And I guess because people are asking who has what and how they do it, I mean, anyone who uh, attended the annual report workshop uh, last week or the week before may have seen there was a very minor change in one of the questions that sort of asked about other things you collect and board games was an option there. I mean, I would love to have a better survey of what everyone in the state does. So that's our first very tiny attempt at learning that sort of thing. Um, but I'm definitely going to go through the chat transcript at the end of this and kind of collect all your responses and I can share that out with the group. Yeah, Carcassonne is great for strategy. It can play quickly. Um, for anyone who's not familiar, that's a tile, what's called a tile laying game, which certainly was an innovation when it first came out. And you draw tiles blindly and you play them one at a time and you're building the map as you go or building the board as you go, which is kind of interesting. And there are some basic characteristics. They either have parts of a city or roads or whatever. And as you play a tile, you're allowed to put one of your little people on it. So that's where the worker placement aspect comes in as well. Um, so there's a lot of thinking in that game if, if you get really good at it. And you have a limited number of people. So obviously they don't score for you until certain things are triggered by the tiles. Games that circulate. Checked by staff. Yeah. Checked by staff is probably, unfortunately, the best way to do it. Um, I went to a conference in Wisconsin last May, and definitely the public libraries up there who talked about it, I think we're all in agreement with that as well, that the weighing method isn't great. The uh, So you uh, really, really have to just go through games and check them. Sequence, yeah, that's a good one.
yeah, Werewolf, for anyone who's not aware, that's sort of a secret role game. So everyone is, is secretly given a, a role at the beginning of the game, either villager or werewolf. And some versions have multiple different variations on those. And then it's one of, I think, everyone is supposed to close their eyes or, or in some way hide their their uh, hide the knowledge. And then, then the werewolves, while everyone else is, quote, asleep, make sure they all know who those players are. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you go around and the villagers are trying to guess who the werewolves are before they all get killed. <laughs> And, and yes, there are lots of variations on that. I've heard of werewolf games at conferences and conventions that have like up to 100 or more players in them, which can get really interesting. I'm not sure I would do that in a public library, but unless it was outside, that might be fun. Way unless it's seriously off. Yeah, that certainly could be a good quick check. I've just heard some people comment on it. Yeah, Gen Con definitely would have large werewolf games, that's for sure. Oh, I'm so uh, jealous, Janice. Hopefully I'll get to go this year. Yeah, and for anyone who's doing this sort of stuff, if you want to talk to me offline, I'm putting together a proposal for Gen Con. So if anyone's doing some interesting or unique things with their uh, with their collections, I'd be happy to talk about that off offline. Because yes, as Jennifer mentions, Trade Day is for librarians and educators, and it's mainly presentations like this one, where you can learn about, and you can also learn from the publishers and companies as well. Uh, D-Lin Gen Con is the oldest and largest uh, gaming convention in the country. It started off much more focused towards role-playing games. Now it's probably 50-50 role-playing and board games, or maybe even heavier on board games now. I'm not sure what their exact breakdown is. Um, and for the first 20-ish, it's it just has like 52nd or 53rd anniversary. Um, and for the first 20 or so years, it was up in Wisconsin where D and D was born. Uh, but it's been in in Indy now for a long time. I'm not sure how long it's been in Indy. Ah, oh, that's good to hear, Jennifer. I may talk to you about how you did your presentation. <laughs> yeah, at least 25 years in Indy. That that sounds about right. It's called Trade Day. It's the Wednesday before the official conference starts. Um, and for good or for bad, you can sign up for Trade Day, but you're effectively buying a pass for the entire conference. Since it's geared at librarians and educators, I would love it if they would just have a price where you only paid for Trade Day, but you know. But you do get a fifth day out of it if you're going to do the whole thing. Uh, while the questions and comments are going, I will just go ahead and remind everyone that the LEU certificate is in the, the top box in the middle of the screen, so don't forget to download that. My contact info is at the bottom. Um, as I've said a couple times, I will kind of curate this chat um, and definitely get a record of who has... Uh, stuff and who doesn't and maybe even the names of games that are mentioned and some of those kinds of comments um, how people are using them do a quick tally of that and I can share that out with the list of participants if that's what you all want George this has been a great webinar thank you well thank you thank you so much for doing this yeah Any other last questions? Oh, I see. You're paying. <laughs> so I could get the four days at 200 or I could get trade day at 200 and get the rest for free. Cool. 
but yeah, it's it is a bonus, and and it is very good from what I've heard from lots of librarians and educators. Ooh. I'm sure the state will like to hear that, Jennifer. Thank you. I might get reimbursed. <laughs> Have many of you participated with International Games Week? I guess I'll, since we've got a few extra minutes, I'll definitely ask that. Janice, I believe librarians and educators do get a sneak peek at the the vendor area, sort of first crack. For seven years, awesome. Not anymore. Okay. Oh, they don't anymore. Darn it. Okay, never mind, Janice. Unless you're retail, huh? Oh well. So yeah, International Games Week is usually early November. Um, I don't want to jinx it yet, but I'm pretty sure I'll be on the committee to plan that next year. So if anyone has comments or questions or concerns about it, I will definitely take that to the group. Um, and if you don't know anything about it, it's a, a one-week celebration of games and libraries. Uh, it's now international, as the name would suggest, and um, usually, I have heard that in the past, if you sign up early enough, you get either some free games or you get registered to for drawings. Yeah, six programs, 180. That's awesome. You're welcome, Jerry. All right, well, I think I'm officially done. I'll kind of hang out here in the room for a little while longer if there are last-minute questions, but I just want to thank everyone for attending today. I know day before Thanksgiving may or may not have been the best timing, but I'm glad you all signed up and, and joined us. And look, look out for the link to the recording later, and like I say, I'll try to sort of collate the chat transcript and get any of the important details out to everyone um, and don't forget